This week, the electricity markets for Germany and France, uh, Western Europe, basically, the electricity markets broke. Uh, there's no other way to say it. The price of electricity, um, which used to trade for you know 45 euros per megawatt hour, spiked as high as a thousand euros per megawatt hour, and now has crashed back down to uh, over 500. Um, literally, the intraday move uh, midweek was 10 times the previous average price. <laughs> that's not a sign of a healthy functioning market. Um, that's a sign of deep, deep problems. Uh, and so uh, I, we have uh, uh, said that the resolution of the Western European energy crisis is the single greatest geopolitical event on the table. And uh, watching it unfold in real time is historic stuff. Hi, I'm Kaiser Johnson, and this is the Liberty and Finance and Miles Franklin Special of the Week for August 30th through September 5th. Currently, we have silver one ounce Krugerrand, Britannia, Philharmonics, or backdated Canadian maples for only $4.75 over spot. Sovereign coins from some of the most respected mints in the world. The South African Mint and Rand Refinery, the Royal Mint in London, the Austrian Mint, and the Royal Canadian Mint. The Krugerrand of Britannia and Philharmonics are all three nines fine, or 99.9% .9 pure silver, while the Canadian maple is four nines fine, or 99.99% .99 pure silver. They are all approved for your precious metals IRA, and while there's no minimum order, the Philharmonics come in tubes of 20 coins, while the Britannia, Krugerrand, and Maple come in tubes of 25, and all of them come in monster boxes of 500 coins. We look forward to helping you secure your future and implement your precious metal strategy by locking an order of 2022 Silver Krugerrand, Britannia, or Philharmonics, or backdated Silver Maples, all at only 475 over spot while supplies last. Call us today, tonight, or even after hours and weekends at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. It's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And with us today, a new guest, the chicken from Doomberg. Doomberg, thank you so much for joining us today. Elijah, great to be here with you. Really looking forward to the discussion. It's great to have you. And I was reading your uh, bio on your website, kind of explaining for our viewers who are not familiar with you, they might be wondering why we're talking to a chicken. Um, and I thought it was very ingenious. You know, one of the reasons behind it is it's kind of like, you know, being chicken little saying the sky is falling and you know one of these days you're going to be right and i think if you could explain for our viewers a bit about you know um why why your company decided to have the face of the company uh be a chicken yeah great question and um so when we started doomberg 16 or 17 months ago uh, we had no real social media presence and one of the old adages from for marketing is you can't be remembered if you don't stand out and um if we had just gone with sort of one of our faces um there would have been two challenges with that one is of course we're a team and and so even though i'm the head writer and the person who appears uh, on podcasts as the guest uh, representing the doomberg brand um there's obviously people uh on the team that are just as critical to the project um as i am and so uh, but the second thing and the most important uh, thing and and the reason why we stay anonymous is because um it it, it adds to the brand you know um the, what is this green chicken um we we carefully brand all of our charts and figures and photoshops um, with the green chicken. It's kind of a cute little um, dressed up version of some clip art that we found. And once we designed it, we sort of fell in love with it and knew that it was going to work. And we did some AB testing with friends and family. And um, it just kind of makes people chuckle. Um, it's consistent with the brand. Uh, and, uh, and then once you sort of have a brand, um, the last thing you want to do is sort of reveal the people behind the curtain because it dissipates the intrigue, you know, and, it, and so we'll always be the green chicken. We'll always be anonymous. Um, we've created, you know, this uh, animated chicken that feels very natural when you're talking to somebody on zoom and, and it works and, it, and it, it, it makes you stand out. You know, you can't be remembered if you don't stand out. And we believe that, um, that the color scheme and the chicken itself are, are key elements uh, that explain at least some of the success we've been able to achieve uh, with the brand. It is a very successful uh, company you have there, and it really enlightens a lot of people out there. It's a very popular uh, Substack channel and Twitter that you have. Uh, I'd like to get your perspective because one of the big things you talk about on 
on your Substack is energy. Um, and, you know, energy impacts everything, it seems like. And you've talked about how really this energy crisis we're seeing right now is the key to a lot of the other crises we're seeing right now with, uh, with, with, with respect to war and inflation. Your perspective on all of that. Yeah, we've popularized a phrase um, called energy is life, which is easy to dismiss as a simple sort of, you know, flippant platitude of some kind. But in reality, um, it has a very deep meaning, which which we believe happens to be true. Um, energy drives humanity. Energy, literally your standard of living, Elijah, is determined by how much energy you personally get to waste. Um, red angles don't appear spontaneously in nature. Um, homes need to be cared for. Energy needs to be pumped in. Food needs to be grown and transported. Um, all of that takes energy. And um, during times of, of energy abundance, um, you know, global peace is possible and people are relatively happy and prosperity ensues. Uh, but during times of global energy um, uh, shortages, like we've experienced in the past few years for a variety of reasons that we've chronicled on our Substack, um, then you have war and you have famine and you have riot and you have social upheaval. Um, and why is that? Well, because um, you know, what is the price elasticity of demand for life and who can afford to pay it? Um, and when you go short, these inelastic commodities like oil and gas and food uh, and diesel, um, when you go short these commodities, the, the wealthiest will pay any price. And then since price is set at the margin, but the effects are felt across the integral of society, and those least able to pay get hurt first. And and then you have the social upheaval that, that we see today. And, and so... Energy explains geopolitics. Um, and wars uh, can be explained through who won the energy battle um, and so on. And so it really is a great lens and it happens to coincide with the several decades of experience in the deep energy commodity sector that we bring um, to bear. Uh, and so that's the sort of foundation of Doomberg and the prism through which we do most of our writing. And I know also a big um, aspect of energy out there that has also helped support the U.S. is the petrodollar system. You know, oil being uh, purchased with dollars, which creates a huge demand for dollars internationally. But that could be changing. And, and you've spoken about the possibility of um, really Putin possibly essentially purchasing oil with gold. And other people have talked about this uh, de facto or petro gold standard that's developing your perspective on that yeah uh, he would be selling oil for gold in this case uh, because he's a, a major exporter but I, I understood what you mean by the question um yeah this is actually work that we've borrowed heavily from a good friend of ours luke groman over at um forest for the trees um, we're subscribers to his work and, and he put out a provocative piece um last week that we're building on and a piece that we're putting out um tomorrow but it'll probably be out by the time you publish this podcast um called Dead of Winter, uh, where we're trying to game out how it's going to go in Europe. And and one of the potential scenarios that Groman sees that I think is quite plausible is that um, Putin may be allowing um, friendly countries to purchase oil at a discount, uh, but the way that he's giving them that discount is to uh, allow them to partially pay for it with physical gold at a higher price than the uh you know the london and new york markets are currently the paper markets are pricing that gold out at and so imagine um if putin allowed you to partially pay for your oil with gold but he valued that gold at twenty five hundred dollars an ounce that's a, a de facto way of giving you a discount um and the way that you might take advantage of that discount is you you sell oil short uh, on the nymex you you buy gold and stand for delivery um you deliver that gold uh, to putin you get more oil then you sold short, you cover your short with physical and you effectively get free oil. Or in this case, um, that's sort of a, a way to estimate the discount. Um, there is some preliminary evidence that this might be occurring, um, not yet wide scale enough, but if it is occurring, um, it would put pressure um, on the paper price of gold um, because you would imagine that over time, the arbitrage between what um, London and New York say the gold price is and what Putin says the gold price is would, would converge pretty quickly. So it's a fascinating thing to look out for and uh, a real interesting time in the gold markets for sure. And what is the evidence at the moment that this is occurring or could happen in the near future? Um, so there's all kinds of circumstantial evidence when you just look at the various headlines, you know, um, Saudi Arabia talking about uh, getting into the gold refining business, for example, uh, new gold markets opening up in Southeast Asia. Um, the uh, and of course Putin um, early on was sort of talking about having a fixed price for gold. Remember, and then that kind of like I think the demand was off the hook, and they kind of said, "Well, we'll pay a reasonable price um, for gold." 
there's been some interesting moves in the in the paper gold market, the derivatives market that others uh, with more expertise than we have uh, uh, have have chronicled. But um, it's a pretty interesting time, um, and we shall see. Um, for sure, it will put to the test the you know the hypothesis that the paper price of gold is manipulated because if Putin does begin to accept gold for partial payment for oil on a large scale, um, you could see a revaluing of gold pretty quickly. Um, and and you know. I would direct listeners to Luke's uh, great website. He does a great job of explaining it. And it's certainly an intriguing hypothesis and one that we're keeping a close eye on. It does seem like, as you mentioned, it, it would elevate the gold price because of the arbitrage opportunity there. What do you think it would, what impact would that have on the U.S. dollar if, you know, dollars are not being used in transaction for oil in this particular case? Well, uh, the U.S. dollar and its impact against what currency, right? So all of these measurements are are relative and so one of the things we've pointed out is is you know the dxy which is sort of the standard um the consensus view of the quote-unquote strength of the dollar well the dxy is nothing but a basket of of, of other currencies and 83 percent of that index is weighted towards the euro the british pound and the japanese yen um all three of those regions um are deeply short energy right now and of course their currencies are weakening in the face of that um, and so the U.S. dollar is, quote, strengthening um, against those currencies, which make up the DXY. But in reality, it's just sort of a reflection of the fact that the U.S. is is largely balanced on energy and probably a net exporter and so uh, is doing just fine. But those regions are deeply short energy and must, uh, you know, paper it over with fiat, uh, literally. Uh, and so um, their, their currencies are getting weak uh, and the U.S. dollar is getting strong as measured against the DXY. Um, as measured against the ruble, the Russian ruble, for example, um, it's not doing quite as well. In fact, the Russian ruble is the strongest currency um, performance year to date, I believe, of any sort of major and minor currency out there. Um, and that's because Putin is a major energy exporter. And, and during times of energy shortages, um, if you control the energy, you control uh, a lot of uh, a lot of geopolitical dynamics, as we're, as we're learning, you know, with the failure of the U.S. and Eastern Europe, Western European sanctions against Russia. It does seem like we are also, as you mentioned, seeing an energy crisis in Europe right now. Can you expand on kind of what we're seeing with respect to energy in Europe and what kind of an impact this will have on the economy? So what we're seeing right now is a desperate scramble for molecules, uh, natural gas molecules in particular, but coal and oil uh, as well. Um, and the reason is because uh, at the margins, Putin controls the supply of natural gas going into Europe. And um, he is the flow of natural gas uh, is cut dramatically from prior years. Um, and um, the Western Europeans are accusing um, Putin of using, quote, energy as a weapon, to which we would say yes. Um, and we gave him that leverage um, through foolish policies over the decades that got us into the spot. Um, so right now, um, there's talk of rationing, of having to cut 15 to 20 percent of European natural gas demand, which would be quite devastating uh, to their economy. There's uh, a scramble to reopen coal plants, uh, if you can believe that. Uh, the price of coal actually on an energy content basis it today is more expensive than the price of oil, which is pretty remarkable given that oil is so useful for so many things and coal can basically only be burned to produce heat um, and uh, electricity from the heat. Um, and so it's a really uh, amazing thing. Um, we're putting out a piece on this very topic soon and and We've been discussing it for some time. Our very first piece on highlighting the energy crisis in Europe was written all the way back in October of 2021, if you can believe it. Um, it's been a slow moving train wreck uh, that we've chronicled um, over probably a dozen pieces. And uh, to watch it unfold in the way that it has is truly incredible. This week, the electricity markets for Germany and France, uh, Western Europe, basically, the electricity markets broke. Uh, there's no other way to say it. The price of electricity... Um, which used to trade for you know 45 euros per megawatt hour, spiked as high as 1,000 euros per megawatt hour, and now has crashed back down to uh, over 500. Um, literally, the intraday move uh, midweek was 10 times the previous average price. <laughs> that's not a sign of a healthy functioning market. Um, that's a sign of deep, deep problems. Uh, and so uh, I, we have uh, uh, said that the resolution of the Western European energy crisis is the single greatest geopolitical event on the table, and uh, watching it unfold in real time is historic stuff. You mentioned it being the single greatest geopolitical event. So 
how you know a lot of our viewers actually do you know live in the u.s so how is this going to impact things globally um and not just in europe so it is leaking into the u.s um, the u.s as mentioned earlier is uh, blessed with an abundance of energy resources and a reasonably stable political system that allows us to extract uh, a good chunk of it um, but um Luckily for us, natural gas is not a global market, uh, although it does influence our market. So natural gas today is trading in Europe, let's say, for $70 per million BTU. Uh, in the U.S., it's trading for $9 per million BTU. And why is that? Well, um, it's very difficult to ship natural gas around the world, and there's insufficient capability to ship enough natural gas around the world to totally equalize regional markets. And so you have these pronounced uh, arbitrages that exist. And that's because of um, the limited capacity for liquefied natural gas exports, carriers, and imports. The infrastructure just does not exist yet. Uh, people are rushing to build it out because arbitrage drives economic uh, behavior. But um, the price of natural gas in the US at $9 is still four and a half times what it was two years ago. Um, two years ago, we couldn't give away natural gas. Um, in fact, in the US, until very recently, um, the inability to take off natural gas uh, limited our ability to produce oil because of, you know a lot of it is associated with the production of gas. And if they don't have a, a place to put it, um, they can't drill for more oil. And so um, that's only changed recently. Uh, we're now exporting 12% of our natural gas, which is right at, at the limits. Um, and most of that now is going to Europe for excessive price. And the exporters of that natural gas uh, are making a killing. And the um, US-based manufacturing facilities who use natural gas as an input but get to sell their product at global prices are also making a killing. Um, and, and it's a really good time to be those people, which by definition means it's a really bad time to be a, a European-based manufacturer trying to compete on the global scale um, with $70 natural gas. It's just crazy. Now, when it comes to how this is impacting the U.S., obviously, as you mentioned, natural gas prices are through the roof compared to a few years ago. You know, gas prices are still extremely elevated than they were before, um, you know, at the beginning of this year. Um, how is this going to impact inflation across the board? Because, you know, the the narrative is out, out there that the Fed is going to you know, be able to possibly, you know, control inflation by raising rates. But it seems like it's a lot more complicated than just, you know, a monetary policy issue. If a lot of it is having to do with rising energy prices and a lot of those aspects, the Fed has no control over. Yeah, I think there's a controversy right now as to whether the Fed has any control over inflation. You know, if you think about who, who where's the manufacturing hub of the, of the, of the earth, it's in China. And they're desperately short energy as well. And they're paying $400 a ton for coal. They're paying $60, $70, uh, a million BTU for cargoes of, of LNG. Although there is some reporting in the market that they're flipping those cargoes to Europe for profit, <laughs> which is, you know, classic. Um, so yeah, it, 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 the shortage of energy, um, just, let's just take Europe. Um, this week we saw a, a major aluminum manufacturer partially shutting down because the power prices make production of aluminum impossible. That's going to be uh, bullish for the price of aluminum. Um, that's going to cause uh, the production of vehicles uh, to go up in price. Um, the European chemical sector, um, BASF, we wrote about them in a piece called More Bun for Bun. Um, you know, they're at risk of being shut down. The, the entire European manufacturing model is predicated on plentiful access to ch cheap Russian natural gas. And um, that access has not been turned off largely. And so the bad scramble um, is, is, is inflationary at every turn. Um, you know, so as much as we might think that natural gas is expensive here or that gasoline uh, at the gas station uh, is expensive here, it's incredibly cheap compared to what's going on in Europe and Japan um, and, and in China. Uh, and so we have it incredibly well, but that, well, it should only serve to tell you how bad it is out there because this is, you know, it's been a very tough six months for the president and his popularity because of, you know, uh, rising um, gas prices uh, at the pump. Um, imagine what's going on in Europe uh, and, and in Japan and China. And even in the U.S., even though we have it better here because of lower energy prices than abroad, 
a, a lot of people are unable to pay their energy bills. I think it was around 20 million people in the U.S. can't do that right now. So that that's nearing 10 percent here. So uh, your perspective on that and how do people prepare for this continuing inflation? It sounds like going forward due to I mean, one factor is these uh, energy prices. Yeah, and of course, many of the products that we import are are manufactured in regions that are uh, experiencing uh, inflation as well, and so that those prices will probably be passed on here. And then, of course, once inflation expectations set in, um, then things become a challenge. Um, you know, I, it's very difficult. It depends on somebody's individual financial um, circumstances, of course. Um, our whole strategy is we um, we earn money in fiat, we save money by buying real assets, uh, and then we sort of invest privately um, as opposed to in the stock market um, where we can affect the outcome. Um, you know, for individuals out there, uh, one of the things we advise um, our clients to do, for example, is just increase the working capital allocation for your the, the, the goods that you need to run your home. Um, that is both an insurance policy against shortages and, and a way a hedge against inflation. So um, you know, the, the, the things you consume to operate your home is, is a big part of your expense. If you could pre-buy a lot of the stuff that doesn't spoil, um, you will be both insulated against potential supply chain shortages as well as, in a way, locking in today's prices and getting ahead of inflation. Now, if everybody does that, of course, then you end up with <laughs> with product shortages. But most people are oblivious to it until it um, until it actually happens. But uh, judging by the, the the by the demographic of your average listener, I'm assuming most of them are wondering about how they can protect um, their wealth uh, from an investment perspective. That's a, that's a pretty interesting challenge. You know, there's some specialized products out there. Obviously, we own physical gold, um, land, you know, um, the types of things that are durable, that are real. That's how we save our money. Um, and we, we view um, the acquisition of real assets as sort of putting a floor under our net worth. I think one of the things that you mentioned really caught my interest. You said that um, instead of investing in the stock market, you invest in um, assets and investments that you can control the outcome of. Can you expand on that? Because I know uh, we were just uh, interviewing Jim Rogers. And one of the things he always says is to only invest in what you really understand. Don't invest in anything you you can't understand. And I think if you have a direct uh, input into that company or if you have a direct uh, tie to the outcome of that, then that's definitely something that you understand. So if you can expand on kind of your strategy there. Yeah. So our strategy, um, again, it, it our business, you know, we, we were a bespoke consulting firm before we created Doomberg. Um, we've put that business on hold for new clients, but we have some legacy clients that we love and still work with. Um, through that work, we've done uh, a fair amount of uh, advising on private equity deals and venture capital investments and so on. And we have learned over time um, that if we have the ability to lend our network or our expertise or our management skills or you know, uh, recruit a good CEO. Like if you know that you're going to be able to put some sort of, we call it sweat alpha uh, into the business, um, there's far better opportunities for multiples, uh, multi-bagger returns um, if you can get the right investment at the right price at the right time. It's not for everybody, um, but it it is a sort of um, a fortunate byproduct of the type of work that we do and would consult with you know c-suite executives and and wealthy family offices on on all manner of strategic and financial considerations so if you see the right deal it's much better to sit on cash and only invest in the very best deals where you think uh control is the wrong word of course where you can impact the outcome where you can um you can tip the scales a little bit um and then you know the private markets are risky as well and you know we've been stolen from and investments have gone to zero and um you know people walk off with money and don't fulfill their commitments and you learn from all of those lessons and so you can't you know there's a reason why that that the sec you know restricts such investments to accredited investors because it can be a bit of a shark tank Uh, but if you get the right people and the right um entrepreneurs and the right sense of and judgment of people and the right um, ability to to analyze a potential business opportunity and decide to go big on one or two, it doesn't take too many deals to sort of transform your returns. Um, and so it's not for everybody, it's, but it's how we like to do it. And, and we, we have found um, good success using that approach. And I think one uh, also uh, investment that you mentioned with is, you know, physical precious metals that is really open to everyone because, you know, an ounce of silver is, you know, 20 bucks or so. Uh, your perspective on that, if you could expand, expand on your, your philosophy when it comes to investing in metals. Yeah, so I wouldn't call that investing. Um, so I would consider that saving. 
Um, and so, as I said earlier, you know, we, we earn money in fiat. Everybody has to, you know, I, I don't pay my groceries in grams of gold or in Bitcoin, um, but we save by buying real assets. And so um, a certain amount of excess earnings um, gets uh, diverted into or allocated to buying real estate or buying physical gold and having it stored or um, pick your favorite. Um, we're big believers in having um, tangible things and um, and not having any debt. Um, now, you you could argue that debt is a great inflation hedge because you just sort of uh, pay off your fixed debt with, with worthless fiat over time. But um, we, we've always been sort of anti-debt um, in the way we've operated our our budgets. Um, we don't have any debt in any of our businesses, you know. Um, and so um, that's just our approach. And so every ounce of gold, every gold eagle that um, I acquire um, is something that I would um, hand down to, to my kids. And, um, you know, the number of gold coins that it takes to buy an SUV today is probably going to be the same number of gold coins it's going to take to buy an SUV in 25 years, uh, assuming we're, we're allowed to purchase them. Um, and so that's sort of the approach. I don't view it as an investment. And so um, I, once I buy gold coins, I don't look at the price of gold on a day-to-day -day basis. I consider what the price of gold is when I purchase it. And then it either goes in my safe or goes in storage um, if I buy enough of it. It's just definitely a mind shift uh, and a perspective shift that people sometimes go through. And I know I've gone through is thinking that from one one time thinking, you know, savings in the bank is the best, you know, is the safest. It's just, you know, right there. It's not it's not going to go up or down or anything like that. But if you just think about it, it does go down based on inflation. But savings and metals, you know, you're going to have the same amount of ounces. Um, and it's it's been, you know, pretty stable throughout all of history. It's always held value for, you know, 6,000 years. So it's definitely is a uh, mind shift when you think of it definitely is a perspective shift when you think of metals being savings. I think that's so key. Yeah, we don't like to speculate in precious metals, and uh, as as we don't like to speculate in anything if we can avoid it. You know, but we've done it. Uh, everybody has gone through the same learning cycle. Um, we are not good speculators, um, and so one of our philosophies in life is a mindset of continuous improvement. And um, the first thing that you should stop doing is things you're bad at, and the things uh, that you should do more of are things you're good at. Um, we're good at helping private companies flourish, especially small to mid-sized ones. Um, we're good at um, writing. <laughs> we're good at doing analysis. Um, and um, we're not good at speculating. Um, and um, so we stop. It's very simple. If, we, if you have other ways to compound your wealth, um, pursue those. Um, you know, and, so, and in fact, it's a blessing for Doomberg because um, we can write about companies in specific economic situations without having a financial interest in the outcome, which allows us to be um, as freed from sort of editorial constraints as possible. All right. Well, Doomberg, thank you so much for joining us today. Before I let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where can our viewers find you online? Yeah, no, it's a fascinating uh, conversation, Elijah. Thanks for having me on. Um, and just keep an eye on Europe. Um, and you can find us because, uh, I, as I said, I think that's the biggest story that's playing out for our eyes. Um, you can find us uh, at doomberg.substack.com, uh, which is the primary outlet for our work. Uh, we are 100 percent um, subscriber supported. Uh, we do not accept ads or sponsorships. Uh, other people do, and that's great. Um, but our business model is to be as uh, editorial free as possible. So 100% uh, subscriber supported um, and uh, every new subscriber is precious. And, and we're also on Twitter um, at Doomberg T as in team. Uh, unfortunately, somebody's squatting on Doomberg, but that's all right. Uh, we've built up a nice uh, following on at Doomberg T. So Elijah, thanks again. It was great. All right. Thank you so much and God bless. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is a rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. 
The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.